Hello, my name is John Schneider. When I was a kid, I used to visit my grandma Vi in the Jersey Bayshore area, and I'd take 8mm movies of my family and their friends. In fact, I was the family filmmaker. Today I live here, but traded my film camera for video, and recently shot this tugboat in the Shrewsbury River. Welcome to Jersey Bayshore Country. This is where you'll find Raritan Bay, the Atlantic Ocean, as well as Sandy Hook Bay. Where is the Jersey Bayshore? Let's get oriented by starting with the big picture. It's somewhere in here, part of the universe and definitely part of our world. But it's like no place I've ever experienced. And as soon as we land, I'll show you around. Hancock is, in actuality, the entire Sandy Hook Peninsula, or Spit as it's technically called, and it includes the U.S. Coast Guard property. The installation was closed in 1974, and the peninsula was transferred from the Department of the Army to the Department of the Interior. The Coast Guard base was transferred to the Coast Guard in 1950. In 1982, the entire peninsula was designated the Fort Hancock and Sandy Hook Proving Ground National Historic Landmark. And this national level designation places Fort Hancock and, and the entire Sandy Hook Peninsula in the top 3% of all historic sites in the United States. Part of my research on the fort led me to the Army Ground Forces Association, a nonprofit organization dedicated to promoting and facilitating research, interest, and pride in American veterans of the Second World War. The association and its members specialize in the restoration, preservation, and interpretation of the history of the United States Army's Coast Artillery Corps from 1895 to 1948. And I recently participated in two of their events which were open to the public. One was the Lantern Tour, which required flashlights, while the other took place the very next day and required really comfortable shoes. And if you get a chance to take either of these tours, do so. The volunteers are knowledgeable, committed to restoration of the historical facilities, and they are very interesting people who take their role seriously. Okay, we're going to go to Battery Gunnison New Peck. We'll tell you about why it's called New Peck when we get there. You'll also pass the Harbor Entrance Control Post. We're also going to go past the Proving Ground, and we're going to show you Army Ground Forces Association's gift to the Park Service. We opened up something that they haven't seen in probably six decades here. Take them off. We're relating 1943. We, in May of 43, the United States, Britain, and France had just taken North Africa from the Germans. The Germans surrendered there on, on uh, 9 May 1943. So we're just beginning to get on the offensive. But it doesn't mean life here is really good. The harbor defenses in New York were critical because they kept the harbor open. 60%, on any given day, 40 to 60% of everything going to Europe left from this harbor. Wow. If you bottle this harbor up, you've suddenly made life miserable for Winston Churchill, Dwight Eisenhower, General Bradley, all the rest of those guys. So they want this harbor open and moving. They move over 100 ships a day out of this harbor, every day over 100 ships. So the Army's task was to keep the harbor open, okay? In March of 1943, the Germans sank 926,000 tons of shipping. One month, 926,000 tons of shipping. So, talk a little bit about Fort Hancock. If I say to you Sandy Hook, and I say Fort Hancock, is it the same thing or different things? Different, different things. Thing. Same thing. Fort Hancock is the entire peninsula. The Army completed purchase of it in 1814, 70 years before they developed a weapon that would actually close off the harbor 
defense, but they knew buy the land, we'll need it. So in 1814, they bought it. So this whole peninsula is Fort Hancock. That's the change you'll see on the National Park Service's website. This here is called the historic post. A post is where the buildings are located, okay? There were nine posts out here, not just this one, there were nine. But the other seven, three of them were actually combined and were pieces of all of this that became what we call Fort Hancock, the historic post. The other seven were temporary. They were designed to mobilize troops and to bring large numbers of troops here. The average garrison was under 1,000 in the 1920s and 30s and the teens. Okay, When we went to war, we went from a, maybe six, 700 people to over 5,000 and supporting another 3,000 infantrymen and field artillerymen and engineers all up in the highlands renting property and, and li living out in fields. The whole thing was Fort Hancock with some little pieces out for life saving and for the Coast Guard, but the land was owned by the Secretary of the Army. Guns and the fire control instrument to learn how to turn angle. Okay. This is the Harbor Defense Command Post. Brigadier General Philip Gage, who was the first commanding general of the Harbor Defenses in New York, his office was in here for a combat situation. And this was the nerve center of the entire defenses of New York City. You see this wall? And the wall was defensive. It was designed this way in the 1890s. What that was was a machine gun nest. So if you got inside of here, there's a machine gun there that would take care of you nice and neatly along inside of here. Oh my God. But think about this for a minute. This is a harbor defense fortification designed to shoot at ships. If your job is to shoot at ships and suddenly your machine guns are going off in here, you probably got a bigger problem than the ships in your harbor. What you're actually standing in is one of the most historically significant structures in the United States of America. This was the very first time in American history the United States Army messed with a weird newfangled material called concrete. And this was the first concrete mortar battery built in the United States and this with battery potter, lift gun battery number one, which we're going to pass in a little bit, launched a building program that went on from about 1890 up until about 1943-1944. U.S. Army's long love affair with reinforced concrete began where, uh, where you're standing. This battery was originally armed with four uh, mortars per pit and four pits. It's a total of 16 mortars. Mortars shoot straight up in the air to come down and punch through the deck armor of enemy ships. Soon will not survive out here. So. You can see the railroad tracks. This is how your ammunition would go in. So right there, that's part of the shed for a searchlight. Remember, we're coming into radar in 1941. So what did we need at night? <coughs> Searchlights. Battery Granger, two 10-inch disappearing guns. Remember I said 10-inch shells back there, they weighed about 800 pounds, six to 800 pounds. This battery was a practice battery in the 1940s. So from 1940 to 1941 and into early 42, the troops would come from their other batteries and come here to shoot. And the main reason they did that is so they didn't wear the other guns out. This is the infancy of concrete construction in the United States of America. They would literally put in a mobile concrete plant and keep going until the battery was done like the colonel was talking about. But what they found out very early on was that they are prone to moisture issues. There were two high-powered telescopes up there in a wooden two-story building. Think of the harbor entrance control post as a Navy uh, air traffic control tower for ships. We said before, there's a hundred ships a day going in and out of this harbor. We're doing that without <laughs> radar, we're doing it without computers. And what they would have up there would be a semaphore lamp. You've probably seen those in the movies or if you've visited a historic ship. And they would also have a large flagpole to run signal flags up and down. And what the Navy HECP does, as the vessels come into the harbor, they would give you a challenge code and you would have to reply. At dusk, right around now, the harbor gets shut down. A couple of things happen. We turn on our harbor minefields. Who knows about the minefields? There are thousand pound underwater mines sewn from here all the way to Breezy Point. You're not getting into my harbor. That minefield is contact activated. It gets turned on at night. We have sona buoys to listen for uh, submarines trying to sneak in. We have searchlights all up and down the coastline. And the harbor was locked down until first light the following day. So imagine what it would have been like to have been on a ship coming in a little late. Harbor's locked up. You're not getting in. You have to drop anchor offshore in U-boat alley. 
not exactly a pleasant experience. So, very stressful environment in the 1940s. This proving ground operated from 1874 to 1919, and every weapon the United States developed for the First World War and about a quarter of the weapons we used in the Second World War were all test and proofed here. Proofing means you prove that it works, okay? So what you got down there is what they call a gun line. Every major piece of American artillery developed between the 1870s to about 1915 was physically tested out here on this line. There were accidents, very big accidents, that there were 14-inch, 12-inch guns, things like that would explode. All of a sudden, the Army gets looked at and says, guess what, dudes, you're going to secure the best port in the Far East, Manila, because it's American now. So we start building forts. So a group of engineers get together and they decide, we're going to take a small island, we're going to cut it off to sea level, and we're going to build up 30-foot thick concrete walls, and we're going to put these big, huge Army turrets on them. Not Navy battleship turrets, but these are Army design. Two gun, 14-inch turrets, two each. Each turret weighed over 500 tons. So, this is Army Ground Forces gift to the Park Service because I bet nobody knew this was here. Nope. How many guys, years you guys been coming out here? And how many of you have ever seen this thing? Okay, so you're welcome to come around this side here and walk up. You want to be careful. They tested it, they made sure it worked. Then they took it all apart and shipped it to the Philippines. It was because those turrets were nearly impregnable to land-based fires. Okay. 245th Coast Artillery gets their activation notice on September 16, 1940. They're down here in a truck convoy about a week later. We spoke that there were several thousand of them when they arrived. If you look at that cantonment area, that's really not big enough to support several thousand brand new soldiers as is. While they're building those barracks out here, they don't have enough of them built in time before the winter sets in. So the area that is now Gunnison Beach parking lot is the campground for the 245th Coast Artillery. They built wood frame structures and enclosures, and uh, they put up tar paper, and then they put their tents over top of it, and they had a coal stove. I'm going to have you guys keep walking. You keep track of the count here. Okay, if you're coming in here and you're moving around at Fort Hancock in 1943, everything is controlled. Everything is very tight because they're concerned about the Germans actually getting in here. All right, so everybody's armed. Everybody has to know the challenge and password. You have to know how to come upon a station. So we have a station. See that gentleman down there in the blue uniform? And his job is not to let anybody pass him. Password? Wendell. Okay. All right. Let's pull everybody in here. What we're going to do is break you into groups of approximately 15 people. We have a medical station here on the corner of the uh, battery. In the center is the plotting room, okay? That's where we generate firing data. On the end is our machine shop, okay? And you can see Tech 5 Komorowski outside of it. He's a skilled machinist. You will enjoy listening to him. Uh, you'll be up on gun platform number one doing gun drills, and you'll be in the magazine. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six stations. Like I said, watch the step. You would actually have two of these scopes. You'd have one for watching the ship, and the guys, you know, zero in on that. And then you have another one where the guy watches, if you're shooting at it, the splash of the water because your eyeballs aren't going to go like this and this, you know, especially through those scopes. So that's called an asthma station. It's usually you know, several people out there, and we'd all have our own personal weapons, because you never know if somebody might be landing and coming up behind you to try to knock out the asthma stations, because without them, the guns don't know where to shoot. It sounds funny, but with the reading glasses, I can see the grid lines in it. Without the reading glasses, I don't see anything. Oh my goodness. That's an original one. That's the original. But other than that, I mean, the boots are, uh, actually the boots are British, but they're royal. Right. Well, <laughs> wait, wait. <laughs>
the two arms come together, that's where the ship is on this scale map. Rounds in a minute and a half. That means in a minute and a half, we're dropping rounds either on or very close to the uh, which calculated very precisely how to bring the rounds back onto target. After a minute and a half, and once you're once you have the corrections correctly entered, uh, you could uh, hit them a lot more than one in ten. Okay, these are the phones uh, are contacting us. This room was actually the generator boiler room for the plumbing room and the gun battery to keep it warm. It was also the chemical disinfection room. So uh, there was a whole process. The plumbing room was chemical protected from gas, potential gas attack. And if you needed to get in there and you were outside and you were contaminated with particles of gas, this airlock and a foot operated compressed air hmm. device blew that off you and it collected it and exhausted it from the building. Is it, uh, is it still functioning? No, no. We got it as a donation and the cord had been cut. Rates on kilovolts. It's clear material in there. This is um, just. The black ones were what they call practice rounds or heave two rounds. This is the first one that would be fired just to get the ship's attention. Oh. <clears throat> These here are armor piercing rounds. So then what they would do is open that and then there would be the powder bag in here and they would pull it out. And that weighed like 38 to 42 pounds if you're heading. And then you would take it out the two powder passage. The way it worked is the ship's the convoys would come in and all communications would by blinker light or signal flags. No radios were used because the enemy could intercept those signals. So what would happen is they would signal a ship to stop and issue the challenge. They would have to have the correct password. The, the shells were brought up on a hoist. That little black square you can kind of start to make out on the, the hillside there. Well, there used to be a bridge that connected this gun deck with that, with that opening. Okay. Oh, now. Yeah. Yeah. Drop it. They've been rotating. Oh, you guys are welcome to come back if you can. The next day, it was time for a five-mile hike, which started where we ended the night before, at Gunnison Battery. And today, there were a few new faces to lead us in the right direction. And here is a generator building. The Park Service has been on a process of getting rid of a lot of the vegetation. About four months ago, you couldn't see this building. It was completely covered in vegetation, and they opened it up. In the event of the main post power plant, which is located by Battery Potter. Who knows where Battery Potter is? A couple of you. Okay. That's where the main post power uh, location was, was built. In the event that that got knocked out or suffered a malfunction during battle, all the gun emplacements had their own auxiliary power source, and that's what this building was. This is the generator building for Battery Gunnison, which we were just at, and right over behind us, over here, there was a 60-inch searchlight, and this is where you want to take a look at your tour handout. We'll actually cross over walk on the left side of the road. Yep. I need a road guard there. there's a number of things that you can actually see out here that are remnants of Fort Hancock and what you see yeah, there, there is steel there is yeah. one of the floors and one of the steel arms essentially what they did in the 1950s they blew it up in place and dropped it so that's your base floor of the tower right there then when you get here you'll see a piece of cement with a stake in it it's actually a floor Right here, a piece of floor of the tower. But then when you look straight up, 
you'll see some cement and what looks like little square boxes in that yeah. cement up there. We're not going to walk up there because we're going to see more of that later. But essentially, that's terracotta conduit encased in concrete. That's carrying all your telephone cables. It is yet, but we'll figure it out. <laughs> and two disappearing searchlights. All right, we're gonna see one powerhouse and one searchlight when we go in here. See this page? All right. You know, it's important for visitors to appreciate the relics which exist on Sandy Hook, sometimes just lying on the ground without a sign or a marker to explain what you're looking at. But it's even more important to leave these relics exactly where you find them. In fact, it's a federal crime to remove relics from the park. You had this massive concrete counterweight on one end and that would preponder that multi-story tower. And if you look closely, you'll notice that the top portion that the searchlight was mounted on would swivel. So it sits flat on ground level and as the tower goes up, that, uh, that platform levels out and the searchlight will be sitting on a stationary horizontal platform. The framework that's left, you'll notice there's all kinds of rivets here. Well, a lot of this steel would just come in plate form and they'd actually fabricate it and rivet it and cut it right here on site because they didn't do a lot of custom made steel back then. They put the steel together here. There's another counterweight. We just ran out of time and couldn't cut it loose. We'll get to it later on. These are carbon arc searchlights. And there's a little machine inside there. There's two and they feed these two carbon arc pieces together. Ball we had at the end of October 2012. Yeah. Where we are standing, there was a carbon copy of that mine case made uh, magazine, excuse me, mine magazine that we just walked past. The walls on it are over a foot thick of reinforced concrete in that Quonset hut type shape, that half circle, if you will. You'll notice I said it was right here. Was, past tense. When I got up to that thing, the wave action of Hurricane Sandy had crushed it like a cardboard box. That gives you the idea of the impact of the waves out here at that time period. For, before that time, even this is after subsequent erosion prior to the storm, the beach went at another 100, 100 or so feet. And that really gives you an idea of how things have changed out here. We often talk about the shifting sands of Sandy Hook. You're looking at it right here. And uh, you'll also notice behind us we have a uh, machine gun pillbox, and that is now slowly being claimed by Mother Nature. So if you were to look at that 1944 map and to go to the Park Service page, they have the 1944 map, but go look at their current map, you're going to see a big difference in the northern part of Fort Hancock. All right? It's real small in 1944, it's huge now. This peninsula has actually grown, and it's all on the north end of the peninsula. It's all grown. So the sand that was here is up north. Where we think that they may have had high-speed cameras to capture impacts of large caliber projectiles and what their damage capabilities were. This was, I said, one of two of the mine magazines that we had here. Mine explosives are pretty interesting. The underwater sea mines, which we touched on last night during the lantern tour, they did not stay in the harbor 24-7-365 uh, because ultimately salt water will have its way with them over time. 
The mine crews uh, would practice laying the mines throughout the year, but a majority of them sat on dry land. They were kept painted, they were kept in a state of preservation, but they would only be sown or laid during actual wartime. And that kicked off majorly in the fall of 1941 and the early winter of uh, 42. You know, I appreciated the energy, enthusiasm, and commitment of the volunteers of the Army Ground Forces Association to help me understand the circumstances of our world in the 1940s and to appreciate what life was like in Fort Hancock, as well as to better understand the technology available to us at the time. The history of Sandy Hook and Fort Hancock is a complicated, multi-layered story spanning many centuries. And these tours help put World War II into perspective for me. And I hope you'll take advantage of one of these tours when they become available. Well, that's all for this program. As always, if you see me out there somewhere, hiking through the woods, walking on a beach, flying a drone, <laughs> whatever it is, I hope you'll tap me on the shoulder and say hello, because nothing is more important than meeting you. So long, everybody.